Well, thank you all for coming tonight. Come on in. It's really good to see you. Let's do a, a round of applause for Mr. Tramps for hosting this. Great food, great wait staff, great service, great smiles. And um, my name is Edgar Grisaurus, and it's really nice to meet you. I'm here representing uh, Austin Game Devs, and uh, which is an affiliate of IGDA Austin. And I'd like to introduce, or she can introduce herself. I'm Heather Ross. I head Women in Games Austin. We have events going on every month or other month. We had our first conference this year called Texas Women in Games, and we're um, looking forward to doing one next year. And thank you very much. And this is, uh, this is the first uh, sound design panel that uh, IGDA Austin or Austin Game Devs has done. And I have a feeling there's a common denominator with everyone here who's interested in audio, uh, composing, music, uh, game development. And I, uh, I'm going to start this round before we introduce the panel. I want to show you guys their work. And so we're going to do, uh, we're going to play now a, a reel uh, that I've put together, uh, that I mashed together of everybody's work that's on the stage, and uh, including uh, Heather and I. Uh, so here we go with that, okay? Thank you. All right, so let's get back to here. And so I'm going to take this opportunity to introduce the panelists, and I'd like them to introduce themselves. So starting from the left to the right, Carolyn, do you mind uh, bringing the mic to yourself? And Sure, I'm Carolyn Fazio. I work for every uh, game company. We do entertainment slot machines. Uh, we're a pretty big company here in Austin. I've been doing this for about two and a half years. I've been doing game sound for about 14 years. I've always been a musician, but uh, mostly a music composer, but we, in our games, we do a lot of sound design, so I've become a much better sound designer over the past couple of two and a half years of having to do sounds for everything, including anything from monsters to just inane little paper noises and things, as I did today, so um, it's great being here. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Jeff McMillan. I'm a freelance composer and sound designer who's uh, been working in games for roughly about four years now. Uh, I have one release title, uh, a few bonus tracks in a mobile game called Orizom Trails. That's O-R-E-Z-O-M Trails. You can uh, play it on uh, iPhone, Android, and on Kindle Fire. Um, the bulk of my work has been all through game jams and uh, continuing to uh, perfect my craft and work on some new material. Composition is my primary cup of tea, but have done some sound effect work as well as some implementation as well. Uh, you can see my work online at jmcmillanmusic.com. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Chris Kokinos. I am the lead sound designer at Rooster Teeth Animation. Um, I have been in uh, the industry for a while, for five years now. Uh, I'm currently in animation. But I still have a lot of love for all the game folk. Um, I worked previously at Kings Island Entertainment, uh, which you saw on the demo reel before, uh, and then before there, Game Salad, working on sounds and game design for them. Uh, yeah, I'm super thrilled to be here. Uh, my name is Kelly Houston. I'm a voiceover actress, and I've uh, been doing this for about 20 years. I, I do things for commercial, narration, um, just kind of all over the place in terms of what I do voice on. Um, in your world, for video games, I'm probably best known for Catwoman and um, Black Canary on DC Universe Online. And yeah, that's me. <laughs> Um, I'm Emily, and I actually work at Every with Carolyn. I've uh, been there a little less than a year. Uh, before that, I worked uh, very briefly at Edge of Reality, where I did some sound design work on Transformers Rise of the Dark Spark. Uh, but I'm at Every full-time now, and on the side, I do 
non-commercially viable alt games. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Matt Pearsall, and on a spiritual level, I think I'm like a, like a really good place, you know. I, um, my, I balanced my chakras, I did a little chakra meditation like right before I came out, and, and I felt like that I needed to open my root. And so I opened that up, but like on an emotional level, I'm in a very tough place right now, so I just want you to, guys to bear with me. I watched a marathon of the Queen Latifah show last night on Lifetime. <laughs> And I just found the whole thing like very heartbreaking. Uh, and you know, like, and you just can't recover from something like that. You know, you just don't like get out the next day and you're like, I mean, you, ha you can't watch seven episodes of the Queen Latifah show and be the same person. Um, so that's where I'm at, uh, like, in, in emotionally. And for sounds, um, I have a company called Gleek and we make. Uh, sounds for a number of video games and I've been probably shipped maybe fi around 50 titles uh, I don't want to name drop because I'm still sort of caught up with what happened last night um, anyway it's a pleasure to meet you all all right so We've got a few questions for our panelists uh, that uh, that we'd like to, to pose. And I, I, I'm gonna go ahead and just say. We broke them into different sections so we can cover the, like, the core areas of uh, the industry. So we've got business, creative, and diversity. Um, and we're going to go through each section in that order. And we encourage y'all to discuss things with each other. We're not gonna ask y'all specific questions directly, it's more broad, like asking all of the ones. Okay, you go, you go ahead and start Okay, so first question is unimportant. We're, we're, we're gonna get the technical and gear part out of the way first. What piece or pieces of gear, hardware or software, could you not live without and why? Anybody? Uh, a DAW would be a good place to start. <laughs> uh, if you're not familiar with that, that's a digital audio workstation, Pro Tools, Reaper, Cubase, Nuendo, etc. Uh, yeah, that's you kind of need that to, to do work um, professionally with audio at any capacity. Uh, What's your favorite? Oh, uh, um, <clears throat> Reaper. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I used Reaper for three years at Kings Isle. Um, I was actually a Pro Tools user for a very long time. Um, and if, uh, yikes. And so when I got my hands on Reaper and found out they're just fully customizable and just, uh, wow, it handles things just very nicely. Um, I kind of switched over for a long time. And then now at Rooster Teeth, they are predominantly a Pro Tools studio. So I sneakily use Reaper when I'm not focusing on mixing in 5.1 or what have you. Um, yeah. Yeah, Reaper is, is definitely tops, and it's free to download. If you've never free used it, download. I recommend it, for sure. Very accessible. Do you mind? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I can't live without Ableton Live. I use Ableton Live for everything. My rig is set up remotely so that if I need to travel, I can travel. So I have a laptop, a copy of Ableton Live, push, and uh, the Universal Audio Apollo. And the Universal Audio plugins, I think, are by far the best sounding plugins, even above the Pro Tools TDM, the high end stuff. Um, I use Ableton because, like, sound design became, because of Pro Tools, because of uh, Cubase, things like this, it became a very editing, uh, it became like more of an editing art than a performance art and so Ableton allows me to quickly perform things that I believe the other DAWs don't and when you go more performance based you go to the root of sound design which is at its core like an old performance art uh, they were watching the film they were like hitting you know shit together and like making like mouse ears pop open or whatever the fuck um, so Ableton allows me to do whatever the fuck but in the current era <laughs> thank you and I'm a cakewalk sonar user I've used it for many years originally I was a logic user and they stopped 
supporting PC and I was kind of in a PC world at the time so I switched over to sonar and once you get stuck on a DAW you're pretty much on there for a long time because when you're doing music and sound design is a living you really don't have or want the downtime of learning a a new DAW. It's kind of difficult on the fly to learn something totally new. Um, my go-to plugins I'd say is Vienna Instruments. I can just do really fast orchestral scores and at every we have to do music very very fast. Our game schedules are really quick. We within a couple of months we're through with the game so you gotta be pretty quick and there's quite a few pieces of music for every game. Um, also Spectrosonics Omnisphere, use it every day, yes. constantly. Second is Trillion, best bass. I love Trillion's bass, and I love Stylus. There's so many other things out there that we have. We have like dozens upon dozens and dozens of plugins. That, uh, contact, a lot of the contact ones, some of the composers' clouds are good. Um, there's a lot of things out there right now, and you can go, you can compose really fast. And that's something that's pretty important to me. It probably is for you. Too. I just wanted to say I love Omnisphere. Yeah. But if you ever use it for, I mean, <clears throat> sorry, don't use it for sound design, because because you're not allowed to. That's correct. So, <laughs> what does that mean? Legally, there's like in the contract, uh, like when you download it, it says you, you know, have the to agreement. use it as part of a composition. You cannot solo any of their sounds because basically they're saying you're giving away one of their sounds. Yeah. So you have to use it in the compilation. Sampling issues. Yes, correct. Yeah. Correct. I actually did not know that. <laughs> so thank you for uh, thank <laughs> you for being so informative. <laughs> There's a takeaway for the evening. <laughs> I guess uh, one thing that I really couldn't live without is uh, Ozone by Isotope. Yeah. Uh, I consider mastering to be my biggest weakness as a sound designer. So I do it all in Ozone now and it's all just very streamlined and I can stay very focused and I can usually get it done not necessarily as well as I wish that I could but I can get it done pretty quickly which is uh, super important uh, considering how short our depth periods are. So that would that would uh, be my contribution. Um, I would say for those wanting to get into voiceover you need a good recording software but you don't need you really don't need Pro Tools if you're just doing voiceover out of your house. I use Twisted Wave and it's like less than a hundred dollars and it works really well and it's kind of geared towards voiceover actors. It's very simple. Um, and then also you, you, you really need to have a good microphone and that can make a huge difference. If you have a, a crappy microphone, you're just not going to sound your best. So I use a Neumann uh, TLM-103. That was my go-to for voiceover. I'm going to go really old school and not even talk about digital audio workstations. My personal favorite tool to use is actually, I kid you not when I say this, manuscript paper with a pencil and a giant eraser. Because that, that way I can at least kind of compose whatever I need to to figure out like, okay, we're shooting for this kind of feel for this particular track. So I'm just gonna try to write some stuff and it doesn't have to be neat and organized or whatever. If I can get some ideas down on paper and just jot things down really, really sloppily and just like hammer away on the piano to figure out like, does this sound good? Does this sound the way I want it to? Okay, this sounds great. Let's move on with this. Okay, this doesn't sound great. What do I need to change? That kind of thing. Um, getting a bunch of ideas down on paper definitely helps me to kind of take the ideas that I've got in my head, put them on the paper, get them in my ears after that, and figure out from that point, does this work? Does this not? Um, from there, I can figure out all the other things, like instrumentation, all the other, all the other fun things after that. So, Thank you. Um, I, so I do, I know that they mentioned a lot of different tools. If you're not aware of all of them, we are recording this and it will be available to watch after so you all can watch it over and over as many times as you want um, to get all the information. <laughs> um, so our next question is, what are the differences between being a contract versus in-house staff sound designer or any, anything in the field? And which one do you prefer? Actually, I've done both because I have had my company Sonic Farm since 2002. Um, since I started working with Every, I don't really do much Sonic Farms work anymore. Um, 
but coming from being an independent contractor to being in-house, dealing with the producers that I deal with in-house is very similar. It's a lot easier because you're right there and you're not having to deal with them over the phone or on email, which makes it a lot difficult, more difficult. You're also in-house, you're dealing with your dev team directly and you're not kept at bay from them. As an independent contractor I found I was kind of kept at, away from a lot of the programmers that would have been helpful to talk to and had to deal with intermediary people. So honestly, I enjoy both. In-house I think it's funner. When you're at home and you're by yourself, after a while you get a little lonely, so yeah. I enjoy the interaction. <laughs> Personally, as far as like contract stuff's concerned, um, I haven't really worked anywhere in-house, so I can't really talk too much about that, but some of the pros and cons that I've seen on both sides of the line is that for, for contract stuff, um, if you're for sure pursuing a particular contract gig, um, you are pursuing it because you for sure want to work on that project and the other person wants to work wants you to work for them on that project um, whereas with 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 in-house uh, composition sound design whatnot um, you usually kind of tied down to you may or may not depending on depending on what uh, what's being worked on at the moment uh, you may or may not be tied down to projects that you might not feel as good about working on it, it it might not just it might just you might wind up working on projects that may or may not be your cup of tea and so it's it's sometimes difficult in situations like that to be able to put your best work out there because you're just just completely just not feeling it and so um however as far as like in-house sound design is concerned you're getting regular paychecks and you can keep food on the table and you can keep bills paid and not have to worry about those kind of things. Whereas with the contract side of things, you have to be advertising 24 seven, 365. Because if you're not doing that, if you're not out there marketing like crazy, um, you're gonna, well, you're just, all those things, you just won't be able to pay bills, you can't, you know, feed your face, anything. So um, that's, <laughs> so, so that's, that's one thing you have to. That's one, one thing you definitely have to consider if you're going to be pursuing uh, contract work a whole lot, or whether you decide to, for sure, pursue things that are in house. So, it's all you, Matt. Are you sure? Go. I can't. I can't speak on behalf of being a contractor. So. I can't, I can't speak on behalf of being an in-house guy. Hey, oh. how did did I? That was a bit sexy. That was, that was sexy. sexy. That was very nice. I, I I'm that. I'm a little turned on. Please yeah. <laughs> Sorry for all the boners, dudes. Um, that's weird. Why did I say that? Why the fuck? Why did I say that? Uh, okay, give me a second. All right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All the boners. All the. All the boners? I, can we hashtag all the boners? Anyway, um, I think, so I've tried sort of varying degrees of, in my career, uh, hashtag all the boners. Um, I have been a contractor in-house, I've been in-house, and I've been, I tried this, I had this crazy idea that this summer I was going to work from Germany. And I tried it, and it kind of worked, and it kind of didn't. So Carolyn, like, was was saying basically what's in my head right now, which is kind of more fun to be on, like, on the ground floor with these people that are making the projects. Because when you're off-site, there's this sort of arm arm's length treatment that you get that's kind of unfortunate, and I understand it because you know you have a culture, and you you talk to these people every day, and and then oh you're doing this contract thing, so there's little weird things like your VPN might have access to every folder except for like that one that you need, um, and so I found the best results come from basically being on the ground floor whether you're a contractor like at an office or whether you're um, like working in house that's where the best results I would say come from the most fun is this sort of in-between place where you can have this amazing work-life balance you can work from you know nine to let's be honest four and yeah, two and uh, <laughs> You know, you can you know you can kind of do enough of the content uh, to sort of sustain the the project. Um, the the problem is is that games don't really work like that. Like it's a it's an ever evolving beast, and so you have to sort of be there to evolve with that beast. It's it's not really a fire and forget art. 
it's uh, and so uh, like Carolyn was saying, it's more fun to be part of the ever evolving beast. Hashtag all the boners. <laughs> Chris. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose I can speak on behalf of being in-house. I've been fortunate. I say fortunate, but I've always wanted to try the contract world just because, hashtag all the boners, I can get out around 2 o'clock if I need to to take care of hashtag all the boners. But, uh, <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, you know, I think working with contractors has been kind of, it's been really fun. Um, one of one of the contractors for Rooster Teeth is actually here, David. He's a composer for uh, Red vs. Blue and all those other things. Yeah, you can <laughs> applaud him. Um, and so having someone that is not kind of there during all the hustle and bustle and all the meetings and getting pulled this way and that way for all the things, um, they're just kind of often their paradise, making the things, not being disturbed, unless they have a baby. <clears throat> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, um, in-house is great for a lot of reasons, obviously, uh, you, like, like everybody has said, uh, constant paychecks, uh, insurance, those are pretty great things to have. Um, but yeah, I, I think, um, I, I think no, there's no one answer for everybody. Is contract better or is in-house better? Because I think, uh, if you speak to anybody here who's done both, they're going to probably say, you know, one might say they love this and one might say they love the other. So it's, you know, personal preference. Great. Excellent. All right. Anybody else? We're good? I'd like to move on to, uh, a, I think, a, a very personal question, uh, but one that um, we all want to know your history and your stories behind this. How did you get into sound design for game development? And how do you, is it like... What are your suggestions about for other people to get into it and to further their careers? Okay, so I have an absolutely ridiculous breaking in story. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, pretty much I went to college with the sole purpose of getting a composition degree. I wanted to write music for games. I was like, it started when I was like 16 and I wanted to be the next Nobuo Uematsu, which is really dumb in retrospect, but it is what it is. And um, so what happened is I went to college and, of course, you know, you don't just get a job right away. I was working at a very, very terrible Italian restaurant as a server, host, delivery driver combo. And it was very grueling and very awful. And one day, um, one day, one of my managers came up to me and they were like, Hey, Emily, you want to come in on your day off to do this delivery? And I was like, no, no, I don't. And... And then they were like, but it's to Edge of Reality. That is a game company. You want to work at a game company. And I'm like, you know what? Yeah, okay, I'll take the stupid delivery. And I did. And um, they sign off for the food. And I ask them if they're hiring. And, uh, and they say, maybe send us a resume. And I did. And two months later, I was an employee there. <laughs> Which is, I mean, it, it, makes, it makes for like a really great story, but at the same time, I can't really recommend that other people try to go in the same way. <laughs> so Moral of the story is, though. Um, believe in yourself. <laughs> have confidence. Um, I mean, you know, just take that chance if you have it right in front of you, I guess. The worst thing they could say is no. And Ask if people are hiring. Yes. yes, that too. <laughs> wait, 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 would you have to? Sorry. Would you have to like, like take someone's order and then go drive a delivery real quick and then come back and be like, oh, here's your waters? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I'm just thinking like you're like, uh, so uh, what are we having to drink? And you're like, they're like water, tea, uh, beer, whatever. And you're like, okay, I'll be right back. Get in the car. Uh, then to do a delivery and then get back and then deliver the waters. Is the, the, is the joke that I'd be working as a delivery it's, driver it's for... It's not a joke. It's a question. Because <laughs> you said you did all three of those things. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I misunderstood. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, no, no. You, you didn't. Uh, it just... They just whatever they needed me for, oh, okay, I would do. Okay. It was just like that. It was awful. Don't don't do that. <laughs> no one do that. <laughs> yeah. I'll probably uh, chime in on this one. Uh, my story is not even nearly as exciting, but um, 
back in the day when I got my bachelor's in music, music education, I figured, oh, I wanted to be a band director because I was in band all through middle school and high school, and I, you know, had that passion for music instilled within me. And so from that point, I figured, okay, I want to be a band director. Finally, got to uh, teach band in a very, very small town in the middle of nowhere, Texas. And um, after that particular gig kind of fell through, declining enrollment, declining population of the town, they couldn't afford to keep the program, program gets cut, and so I have to scramble to try to find something to replace it. In the in the in the town that I was that I was living in, um, I was having a long conversation with the pastor of my church who was also the, the the parent of one of my kids, who was also a firefighter, who was also a volunteer EMT. So in small town Texas people wear a lot of hats. But we had like a long five hour long conversation about like where to go from here. And I figured I wanted to do one of two things. I either wanted to uh, get back into teaching but at the collegiate level teaching like music theory or something like that or I for sure wanted to, to write music for games. From that point on, this is like 2009 roughly, so moved back to, moved back to uh, Dallas-Fort Worth where I'm originally from. Um, took some undergraduate courses in composition, applied to several different, several different places as far as uh, graduate school is concerned. Finally got a yes out of Texas State down in San Marcos, so went down there. Two years later, I got my master's in music composition, and from there I was able to learn not only how to uh, hone my craft as far as like my compositional side of things is concerned, but also um, learning how to build a website, learning how to uh, use a digital audio workstation, learning how to advertise that kind of thing. And so, um, because of all of because of all of those things, I was I've been able to stay connected as much as possible, knowing knowing where knowing where the game develop, developers were were hanging out that kind of thing i was able to kind of just make myself known as much as possible attending uh, all different kinds of game jams getting to know people for the first time um getting to work on a project uh from scratch completely just working on something for like 48 hours maybe 72 depending uh getting getting those kind of projects done and out of the way and saying that you for sure worked on this and you collaborated with these people to make this particular project possible, being able to do that definitely helps big time to, um, to, to for sure, to, to, to learn what you, what you, what's needed in order to succeed um, at the level that everyone else up here is for sure, for sure succeeding at. And so, as I continue to do that, um, I'm continuing to learn more things, learning how to do sound effects, learning how to use implementation, learning um, anything and everything that I can as far as um, anything sound related is concerned. So one of the big things I definitely want to point out, one big takeaway from all this, always be working on your craft. Learn something new every single day. Always be working on writing some new music. Always work on like taking some sound effects that you recorded from somewhere and apply whatever plugins you need to in your digital audio workstation to create whatever. Um, learn something new as far as implementation is concerned. Um, most in-house sound designers are expected to be able to do all of those things. And so, if you're for sure looking for something that's a, a full-time gig, being able to do all of those things will instantly put you um, ahead of everybody else. Um, and, yeah, just keep working on your craft. Keep doing things, keep learning things every single day. Um, that's all I can say on that. So. So I guess um, in terms of how I broke into doing voiceover, I guess for games in particular, I, I started out when I was 15 and I started working on camera and then it was kind of a natural progression or my, my voiceover agent um, kind of specializes in voiceover and took me under her wing and trained me and then I went to school and got a degree in theater arts so uh, and then it just kind of was a natural progression from there. Um, I got, I've gotten most of my gigs actually through auditions that I've gotten through my agent. Uh, but there's a lot of work out there that you can get without having an agent as well, especially in this digital age. So, um, but I would say probably the best advice I could give somebody who wanted to, to do voiceover is to get some experience with acting. I think a lot, there's a big kind of misconception about voice acting that it's, uh, it's a lot about the quality of your voice. and there's a little bit about that, but honestly, when it comes down to it, you really have to be able to act. So I would say go get some acting training is the first thing to do. Yeah. Chris? 
Um, all right, well, um, so I uh, moved out here from Florida. I graduated from Full Sail 2007, 8, 9, something like that, so many years ago. Uh, I'll cut to the abridged version of this story. Um, I left everything in Orlando. I packed everything into my Scion TC. I moved out to a place I had never been where I know almost nobody. Uh, and I took a job as a waiter at Waterloo Ice House for six months while going to these things, meeting a bunch of people. Uh, I served beer at a micro talk one day. Um, John Henderson, who I don't think is Woo! here, that wonderful man. I don't know where he is. Let's see, it's not anymore. Yeah, I don't right? think he's here. Yeah, he's, he's not here. He's here in spirit, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, he let me go up on stage, introduce myself. Uh, I guess I made a good impression on someone because they, uh, I went to talk with folks afterwards and they extended uh, the offer of you know, me submitting my resume. And I submitted a resume, went in for an interview, and got the job at Game Salad. Um, and so I, I suppose the, the big takeaway from, from my story is... Um, if you are really desperate for work and you really want to find something, be prepared to give up everything you own. Like, I'm not even joking. Like, be prepared to give up everything. I gave up my, my comfortable life in Florida, my band, uh, my friends, my family, which lived even further south. I mean, I didn't give them up, but, you know, they're, they're still there. I didn't, like, I didn't, like, trade them to some slaves or something, or, or slave owners to go to come up here. Um, but, yeah, be prepared because it's... You know, it's kind of a dog-eat-dog industry, and it's hard to find work. And if you can't find work in the city that you're in, you are you might have better luck looking in, I don't know, uh, Dallas or Houston or L.A. or Seattle or wherever. Um, but do your research. Don't just go out there. I spent like three months doing research on Austin before I came out here. I called a bunch of people. I sounded like an asshole. Uh, nobody ever called me back, which is totally cool. Um, and yeah, so yeah, just be prepared to give things up, make it, make a, make a big jump in your life. Okay, Matt, I know you got a story. Do you have a story? How'd you get into this? <laughs> Carolyn, have, do you want to talk about? This? I have a short story. Good. Um, I've always been a musician all my life and I ended up kind of in the corporate world and I couldn't stand that anymore and I had a friend working for Sony online that says you know you should be a game musician I thought oh that would be really fun I'm gonna be a game musician so I did a little demo reel and I went to an E3 and I was a little intimidated by all the big game companies on the top floor so I went down to the bottom floor where all the little indie games are and I went to each booth and I talked to people and I played their games and I gave out my demos and I got a call back a couple of weeks later from a game company and from then on um, I've been working. I worked for them for quite a bit and uh, I did a lot of work for Adobe um, doing a lot of interactive scores for Adobe software and it's really kind of once you get in there and the people you know they always keep coming back and referring you to other people and it's just kept me working. So no waiting tables for you? There was no waiting tables, no. I went from I'm gonna be a game musician to actually working. But the main yeah. thing is, is when you get the job be able to pull it off. Yeah. Okay, uh, I, I was thinking about how I was going to do this, and it, it sort of goes like this. Um, I'm in a psychedelic rock band. I show my mom, and I'm like, yeah, mom, we do drugs. And she's like, this music sounds druggy. And I'm like, it is. <laughs> and um, she's like, you know, uh, you should make sounds, you should make music for video games. And I'm like, whatever, mom, you don't know me. And then I was like, secretly, I was like, yeah, she's got a really good point. <laughs> um, and so one of the guys I was in the band with, um, was a voice actor on Dragon Ball Z and I was like hey dude can I like work on Dragon Ball Z and he's like yeah dude talk to the talk to the producer so I was like hey dude producer hey dude can I work on Dragon Ball Z and he's like yeah dude as a 
ADR engineer and I was like, cool, dude. So then I started doing that, but I was really shitty at it. Um, and then one day the, the mix engineers got really busy and I was like, hey, I'm going to like do this trailer. I'm going to mix this uh, trailer for you guys. And they were like, oh, well, we just like grab library sound effects. Here's a library. And we just grab library music. Here's the music. And I was like, fuck that shit. I'm going to go hardcore. <laughs> so I like did a fresh music pass and a fresh sound design pass on a trailer for Lupin the Third. And then they were like, you spent way too much time on, on this. That's bad. And then the president of the company saw this and he said, you spent a lot of time on this. That's good. I like it. <laughs> this your new, your new job is now now head uh, like we, the company was at the time they're like 500 people now Funimation but at the time they were like 30 people and so I became like with no experience it's such a bullshit title it's like you are head of the trailer audio department which was just me so I did that for a while and I was like hey there's not a lot of cartoons happening and they don't pay real well like I want to get that squirrel squirrel squat so I can afford my speedboat and then I got a hookup doing games and then my first game came out and I devoted myself to it I I pained over this thing. I was like, those creatures, when they get hit, I feel that. <laughs> when I shoot my gun, I feel this, you know? And like on a deep level. And like, so I really put my heart and soul into it. And the first review came out and it said, if you like paper, no, oh, sorry, pop is just not cool for me, but whatever, I'll deal with it. Um, they said, if you like paper thin gunshots and the most annoying creatures you've ever heard, then this game sound is for you. And I said, I said, universe! And then I went back and I did what you talked about doing. And I just prep practiced every day and I put my all my effort and eventually into that and I was in another electronic weirdo band and we played a show and the guy that put on the show worked at retro and I was like hey I like Metroid and they were like cool we need a sound guy and I'm like cool I'm weird I'm hip with it and they were like cool work on Metroid and then that really kind of started my career it's a luck it's luck so basically here's 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 hot tips tip one get lucky Tip two, be in the right place at the right time. Tip three, never be afraid to go drink. I think that's about it. It's, it's about networking. Yeah. Practice network. I'd like to add, tip four, listen to your mother. Yes. <laughs> and I also waited tables to get into sound design. So I worked at a liquor store. There you go. Uh, <laughs> Okay, we're going to do um, one more question in business. Um, this one's quite important. Um, how do you figure out the audio budget for a project? <laughs> Definitely ask questions. Definitely talk to the people that know a thing or two about what in the world's going on. I would think it would probably be like usually on average about 5 to 15% of the total budget of the project, but that again will vary from project to project to project. So definitely ask the people that know a thing or two about it and just you know, figure it out. And then, um, yeah. In my experience, it's always been really wildly different from project to project. Um, five to 15%, that's a pretty wide range, but in my relatively limited experience, that is what I have seen. Um, but there's also, um, I've, I've done this, and I know other composers who have done this, where they will, if, say, the, if the devs don't have a lot of money, and they don't have a lot of money to spend on you, one way to compromise is to work out a back-end deal so that you get a percentage of the uh, game sales. And sometimes you get not a lot of money from that. Other times the game really takes off and you get quite a lot of money. So for, for me personally it's always very much been a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I'm sure people who've been at it for much longer have a more uh, consistent approach. All right. Whatever. I've done this. Um, <laughs> like, there's a couple of ways to do it. Essentially, like, the cost of game audio, the cost for anything uh, when you're talking about creating um, 
uh, commercial art, the, the cost of that is really your willingness to do it and your lifestyle base. So it's essentially like you want to, and now I'm, go, I'm going somewhere with this, I swear to God. Um, you need to like get a baseline for what it costs you to exist. And then you need to add on to that things like, like I said earlier, speedboat payment, accidental pregnancies, things like this. Um, and then from there, you need to uh, basically like, like add in each, you know, individual. Like so, add in the number of people you need based on your um, your output. So like. The, typically the way I do it is I look at the number of sounds needed in a given time frame and I take that and I'm like okay so that's X amount of sounds to create it takes a, this t this amount of time to create this amount of time to implement this amount of time to iterate and essentially the, the ideal scenario is that you find the person that knows the budget and you basically get five to seven percent five to fifteen fifteen percent really high I've never seen 15% I've seen 10 um, but if you can say if the game's ten million dollars you know 10% of that's a hundred thousand dollars so you can however what is it no it's a million right ten, a million dollars yeah 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 so then you can uh, yeah I'm really shit at math obviously um, you basically just yeah you you you, you dose that out for the duration of the, the project and see how long you can exist. And if that works against your lifestyle core, then you're good. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're going to move on to creative. All right. So let's talk about some creative stuff. I want to first address some voiceover, uh, a voiceover question. Um, I don't know uh, how many of you have seen The Simpsons, but... Uh, Bart Simpson is not a not voiced by a a man or a boy. It's voiced by a woman, a woman named Nancy Cartwright. So my question to the voiceover of all of you, uh, actor or producers, is how often do you have you portrayed voices that are a different gender than yourself or androgynous? And if not, uh, I want to also address another question. How how do you manage multiple voice over character changes within the same game? It's kind of related. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So in terms of in terms of being like a boy or asking to be a boy, um, I honestly have only done that one time where I've had to play a boy. It was like a bully. Uh, most of the time, I'm just playing female characters and. I have gotten a lot where people have said, you know, we want her to be kind of androgynous or masculine sounding. Uh, so those, I've, I've gotten those specs before, but I really haven't played a lot of boys. Um, the people, I do have a lot of friends in the industry um, that are voiceover actors, and the ones that, that do play boys tend to have kind of quirky voices to begin with and really high pitched to begin with. So those are the people that I know that do a lot of that type of work. Um, in terms of like switching from different characters, that's something you, you that happens all the time because routinely they they have you doing maybe four different characters. Even like even if you're playing a large principal role, you may also be playing kind of a supporting role and then a couple of different roles that are you know just a you know pedestrian or something like that. So you you do really need to be able to switch gears and play different characters that sound different. Um, and like I, I touched on before, it's not really about making your voice sound different, although there is some of that. It's really about creating a different character altogether that has a different perspective and a different attitude. So um, and then when you do that, the the voice follows. So. I, I found one thing that I do that, that seems to be really helpful, and this again comes from my theater background, is sort of physically becoming that character, and so I'll take on a different stand. So if I'm doing Black Canary, she's got kind of a real sassy superhero kind of thing going on, so I'll do like a real wide stance with her with like one hand on the hip and kind of a strong, really grounded feel to her. And then after that, if I go move into Catwoman, 
then she's much more sultry and I kind of have one shoulder cock forward and a hip out and that kind of thing. So, so physically, when I physically become these characters, the voice kind of follows and that helps a lot. Um, the other thing that, that I like to do is I start out with the stronger characters. So um, I would do, if, some, if one of the characters is really bold and really animated, that's the one I want to start out with because that's, um, it's, it's easier for me and I think probably a lot of actors have an easier time being big. And then you can bring it down and do the more subtle characters afterwards. Um, and yeah, I guess, yeah. I think I answered the question yet. Yeah. <laughs> Rooster Teeth. Um, so I deal with a lot of voice actors, um, some that are from in-house and some that are, um, you know, local talent that don't work with Rooster Teeth regularly. Uh, Lindsay Jones, who voices the character Ruby in the show Ruby, uh, also voices a male character, a young boy in the show Camp Camp, uh, named Space Kid. Um, kind of in the same tonal range. Uh, nasally, kind of like a young boy with a kind of a higher nasally voice. Um, and I think that might be the only time that I've seen uh, like a female voice actor in, in my like uh, personal experience. I mean, obviously, uh, I think Christine Cavanaugh did so many voices throughout the 90s, uh, Tommy Pickles, I believe, and so many others. Um, uh, but yeah, that that's one of the, the only times. Or I'm sorry, the only experiences I personally have. Uh, however, I have had a lot of experience working with female voice actors that do monster and creature vocals. Um, there's just something neat. I mean, I've had also male voice actors do it, but there's something neat about um, I think how um, the, I guess the the vocal cords, uh, w women's vocal cords, essentially kind of they're higher octaves. They reach different things, different things like. Less, uh, less so gravelly and lower, and more so higher frequency and kind of piercing. It's really great for snakes and birds and, you know, oh, yeah, crickets, yeah. I can see that. Um, but yeah, uh, and for the second part of your question, um, one thing that I've seen all of my voice actors do, uh, every single one of them, everybody from Joel Heyman to Lindsay Jones to Michael Jones, all of them, they all have an anchor word or phrase. Um, like, to get into the character Caboose from Red vs. Blue, Joel says, you know, hello, hello, and he does his voice like a few times before he hits Caboose and then he rolls right into it. Uh, and if he's rolling through his lines and he feels like he's losing the voice, he'll roll right back into that. Um, Lindsay, Lindsay does this thing, she's like, you know, hey guys, hey, and I, I can't do the voice, but she does it in her Space Kid voice, and it kind of just, it's an anchor, it's like an anchor point. So, if you decide you're going to do multiple characters, find a phrase or a word that works best for you and just use that you know it's it sounds silly but it, it works anyone else okay. um so when scoring music for a project how do you focus in on the central elements of the game Repeat the question again. The central what of the game? The central elements. The of central the game. elements. Yes. Um. Well, for my job and for the other films and things that I've scored, you look at it and you just decide. I mean, you can't really score something without seeing it first. Uh, I've had experience being asked to do tracks and have given no visuals at all and direction from producers that are really off. You really have to see it. So I'd say seeing it is believing it. That's what you're going to get your your feel from is just the visuals of it. At least for me. Personally for myself, the um, it ha if if people if people are are looking to 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 sc score f a, uh, a particular scene and and they and they're shooting for a particular emotion that they want to evoke from uh, the players that that are there playing the game or whatnot or if they want to paint this particular picture of the world that the uh, that the characters are in and in which the events take place um, understanding those concepts and understanding like what do they want 
from this particular scene or from this particular track within the game. Um, understanding that and getting whoever is in charge of the project to describe that to you as best as possible definitely helps. If the words don't help, putting something in our ears definitely does. Because you can describe it with however many words, but if you have us listen to a particular track, like, hey, I'm looking for this kind of sound, and we're listening to some band that we've probably never heard of or something like that, or the soundtrack for some game we've never heard of, or some kind of film score we've never heard of before. Um, that's when we start to get a picture of, oh, okay, this is what they're well, this is what they're going for, and I can then write almost in that style, but also kind of add my spin on those particular elements to to make it to make it more unique and to make it um, to make it very akin to that specific project. That when people are playing that game or watching that film, that they know for sure that the that the sound that they are listening for is definitely synonymous with that game or that film. And um, yeah, that's, that's that's basically it on that. So. All right. Well, okay. I'm going to ask another creative question. So, the art of foaling. If you're not familiar with that word, it is creating. It, it came from uh, the uh, film uh, genre, the film background, film industry, and that is creating your own sound effects when they used to stomp, physically stomp on objects and. To, actually, it goes back to the Greeks uh, and making uh, the sound of, of wind and uh, the, the sound of, of stomping of, of, of foot movements. But it's, it's used and it's had a resurgence in, in video game development. And uh, um, so my question to you all is a sound effects related question. And when and why have you had to foley your sounds versus using sound effects libraries, which you touched on briefly? And uh, I'm going to open that up to anybody. Go first. I'll, go I'll happily go first. And uh, do you wait? I'm going oh, to also oh. add. Do you have any interesting sound gathering stories around foley? Oh, oh, <laughs> yikes! Uh, um, well, first, thank you for giving me one more thing to brag about being Greek. <laughs> <laughs> We're we're better than we're we're more than just euros and tzatziki, thank you, uh, and and bad financing. Um, Much better, thank you. Um, so for me, a lot of what I use, I'm very familiar with my libraries. I spent a lot of time at King's Isle, um, learning those libraries, and so I started acquiring those over the years. Um, but there comes a time where I'm like, I oh, I need to finish this, like you know six. 6.30 today, I had to leave to come here, and we needed to get something for uh, an episode of Camp Camp that airs tomorrow. And I was like, oh, sh shit, I don't have this sound. Or I do, but I don't know what to think of. I gotta go. So, you know, we got in the booth, and, you know, you're, you're snapping your finger. And it's like, oh, okay, this works. Uh, all right, uh, let's go. So um, another great ins uh, instance of this was a couple weeks back, um, we were talking about the sound of like the microphone being shook or shaken shook shaken shooken i'm gonna say shooken because i'm making that up now uh and we're talking about it and josh the director for this episode is like yeah you know the sound of a microphone shaking it's like it's like blah 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 i'm like like this he's like no no it's more like blah 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 and i'm like go on go in the booth and just shake the microphone just do it and so he goes and he shakes it and he comes back and this is like yeah, 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 that. I want that sound. And I'm like, okay, we're done. Um, but other than that, I haven't had any full experience on, like, a Foley stage uh, yet. I would like to do that one day. But, yeah, you just, if you can't figure it out, try and make sounds into the microphone with your, your hands or your mouth or your feet or your butt or whatever. Fart sounds are where it's at. <laughs> That was great. So yeah, there you go. See, you see, that was great. Wait, did you just do that? You did. Oh my oh, god. god. Oh man. That, by the way, is the sound of dead space, dead air. 
filling in. <laughs> um, in my personal experience, I've used Foley when I just happen to need a sound that I just don't have in my libraries. Um, when I buy libraries, I tend to focus more on the uh, fantastical and not so much the mundane. So, for example, uh, it reached a point where I needed some good footstep sounds and I barely had anything. So I was like, okay, cool, I guess I'm just gonna have to record all my footsteps. Uh, so that's like a really boring example, but another thing to keep in mind if you're choosing to do fully over using sound effects libraries is that when you have complete control over how um, over how each sound is recorded, that's just another artistic thing that you can add to the whole process. A really good example of this is Limbo. Have any of you guys played Limbo? Ah! Yeah, it's a great game, and it was uh, all recorded using really specific uh, vintage hardware from what I understand and that's what gives it the sound that it has so um, that's one of the cool things about Foley you just have this extra level of control over the sounds that you get and I, I don't have any like super cool Foley stories but I do have a kind of funny one when I was in college and I was uh, literally doing Foley for the first time I, I had like a really crappy USB mic and I was recording like straight into Cubase on my laptop I didn't have like a interface or anything um, I needed some good swish sounds for a sword um, slicing through air. So I had a metal pole that I was swinging around and I was getting some pretty good sounds out of it. And um, so I get I get down to actually record it. And I have my microphone on like a stool and I'm like in my kitchen because I'm just a poor student. I don't have a fancy recording studio to do anything in. And, um, and I figure, okay, let's do some test swings first. And on my first test swing, I uh, I swing it back and I hit the light fixture behind me and and it comes crashing down to the floor. I hope floor. you recorded that. No, no, this is the worst part of the story. I didn't. <laughs> and it was it was such a great I mean, it, it sucked because I had to like clean it all up and there were like dead bugs in there too and it was gross. But the the really the real tragedy of that story is that I didn't record it because that was a really, really great, like, glassy, crashy sound and I'll never be heard again. Oh, <laughs> so don't do that. That is my advice. Record everything. Always be recording. I'm gonna get weird. <laughs> you? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I know, right? Um, so I, I, I feel that, uh, so recording, like we call it fully, which is technically just matching sound to picture, um, but just recording in general, as an artist, I think it's, it's kind of like this, like if you go to Paris and you take a picture of the Eiffel Tower, you could just download that picture, honestly. Like you could go onto Google Image Search and probably get pretty much the same picture, but for some reason you're like, oh, like I need a fucking selfie in front of the Eiffel Tower. Uh, not me personally. I did. I did do that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, like it's the same thing. It's like when you actually create your own content, when you source gather it yourself, the creative process is much more you. It's much more important to what you're doing. So the mere act of you gathering sounds makes creating whatever it is you're trying to create like much more you and if you can point to something in game or it, you know on screen and say like this was 100 percent my concept my source recording and the outcome of it then that makes it much more your art form so that's the power of, of of recording also you know like for me like i keep a microphone attached to my rig at all times and i do this because i do a lot of mouth sounds and i have things that i mess with and i you know like sometimes i want to like a snap especially with ui you want that snap and so i literally snap into a mic i've recorded myself snapping so many times and then I compress it I do I do have this process it's just but it's it's the the act of, of doing it that makes uh, something go from you simply editing and grabbing and and DJing it so to speak to actually creating something now I have a it's kind of, it's funny to me I don't know if this is gonna land to be honest but this is a weird story about field recording I was I was sent to go record electricity at this thing called Teslathon. 
Um, and so I'm thinking like it's like a convention center and there's going to be like Tesla coils and like I'm going to record Tesla coils. I show up and it's like these kind of hillbilly dudes and they're all like, like I literally overheard this. This, this dude, these guys were sitting around and they were watching a video of a big Tesla coil and one guy goes, dude, look at that puppy like pumping out the voltage. Like he literally said that exact thing. <laughs> And then I was like trying to make friends and like this guy had this weird static generator and I was like, hey, I'm Matt. I'm recording sounds for a video game. What's your name? And I forgot his name, so we'll call him Steve. And, and Steve <laughs> says, I'm Steve. And I say, nice to meet you, Steve. Um, what do you do? And Steve goes, I hunt demons. <laughs> and I was like... I was like, well, okay. I was like, that's cool. Um, so how does that work? And he goes, you know, <laughs> typical. Like people, like houses that have, uh, you know, what been watching too much Charmed. All of a sudden they get a demon. I got to go cleanse the house of the demon. And I'm like, cool. Um, and he goes, yeah, they make this really crazy hissing sound. You wouldn't be interested. And I'm like super interested Steve how do I hook it up <laughs> and at this point I wasn't weirded out this guy was in this like weird cult obviously I was like how do I join uh, kidding um, so so Steve I said um, Steve maybe I can get an email so I can record these demons and he goes one moment true story one moment he goes he goes, let me ask my wife. I'm like, to give you my your email? And he's like, yeah, you know, like, on our spiritual birthdays, we became really connected, and we're one entity now, so um, I've got to ask her if it's okay if we, like, give you the email address. And I'm like, dude, I totally get that. You know, I've been in unhealthy things, too. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, a lot of them. So I get you, man. Like... I'm a little drunk right now, Steve. And anyway, so he gives me an email address and it literally reads Stevenifer. Like it's a combination of their names. And at the cults, well, like I'll just call it the cult, at the cults name.com. And then, like, it wasn't the fact that the dude heard demons that weirded me out. It was the fact that he combined his fucking name with his wife's name and had to ask her permission. I was just like, dude, grow some balls. So I never recorded the demons, but that's sort of how I feel about Foley. <laughs> I, I, I use the noises from the, from the electricity, like, still to this day, yeah. Not the hissing, yeah. I was just afraid of him. I was like, we're, you're like, our energies are off. Like, we're not going to vibe. <laughs> <laughs> or he might think that you're a demon and... Carolyn? Uh, no. <laughs> I was like... <laughs> okay. Wait. I was just going to interject something real fast about sound design. I do a lot of Foley at work myself. And just be aware that to be creative about it because even if you use sound libraries, what it says it sounds like, that's not what people want to hear. When you do gunshots, gunshots really are not very impressive sounding. You may need to put something big with it. Maybe like a shotgun when they're just standing there with a little small gun because that thing goes pop. And that doesn't sound very impressive. You want to get something Something that's big. Be creative when you're doing your monster or if, if you have a bear or whatever, if it growls, the actual animal growling is not very impressive. Go find an elephant growl or a, something different. Just be creative about it and just don't always fall for what it is because what it the item actually sounds like is generally not very impressive. I've got a question. Be, being creative about it, does that mean pitch shifting, uh, grabbing the sound, and then manipulating You can do it. that, yes. I've done that a lot. It just, yeah, whatever works. To kind of riff off that a little bit, um, one thing that I created for the Ruby 4 trailer um, was kind of this amalgamation of uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, these walrus growls, uh, a leopard snarl kind of leading into it, um, a handful of other like little creatures here and there. Um, we actually have a guy who does some of the vocalizations for our, our demons, the Grim, in the show. Um, so I had him layered in there. I then duplicated his voice, and I 
I record. So uh, one quick trick: uh, if you ever want to record really big monster vocals, record at a very high sample rate, mm -hmm. and then drop it down. Yeah. Like it will naturally, essentially, make it incredibly big and scary sounding. Um, like I recorded at 192 uh, on our TDM system and uh, our native system, and um, uh, and then I pitched that down. I kept the original recording also involved included I threw decapitator which is a saturation tool I did like so many different things um, but I guess the point of the story is just throw a bunch of shit to the wall and just no no I'm kidding don't don't do that that's just gonna make a mess just try a lot of different things and see what works I mean there's you'd be surprised um, like uh, like Carolyn was saying like the the a bear may not sound scary uh, if you put a bear and you're like, oh, there's a bear, I'm going to grab a bear growl. It's, it might not work. So be prepared to get bigger, scarier things. And also, like I said, try recording yourself at a higher sample rate. You'd be surprised at what you can do. That's awesome. Cool. Anyone else? Yeah, I'll probably chime in on this one too. Uh, as far as like Foley versus like sound libraries, I don't know. I, I might be the lone person out on this one, but I tend to use Foley way, way more than sound libraries, probably because I just never actually spent the money to go get sound libraries in the first place. But I, I, I tend to be a little bit more of a purist and almost exclusively use Foley unless it's completely impractical for me to go record some, to go, to go get, to get some kind of sound. I'm not going to be like, I'm not going to drive like three hours away to some person's ranch to stand there in some dude's ranch with a microphone up to a horse's mouth and just hope and pray that it's going to make some kind of sounds. It's, it's, not, it's, it's just impractical in a situation like that. And so in situations like that, it's totally okay to just for sure use sound libraries. But yeah, as far as like Foley goes, I when I was doing a lot of my sound effect, sound effect work, um, I knew for a fact that I just wanted to create as much of my own stuff as I could. Uh, in order to show that I can create a lot of my own original stuff from scratch. I don't know if that, how impressive that really is, but I've done a number of things from like dropping glass bottles onto concrete sidewalks from 10 feet high up and hoping that I don't accidentally hit my recording device in the process, all the way up to like going into a foot locker and like putting the microphone up to a shoe with Velcro on it and just undoing and redoing the Velcro a few times telling them to turn off their music beforehand so that I can actually you know get just that sound to standing out to taking it like an actual chair like one of these chairs that's here and like taking it out to the sidewalk and just like dropping it on the ground a few times getting those kind of sounds too I think there's like one or two times where I've done some really weird things like like I think it's like some. I think it was Saint Edwards, where I was working on a game jam, and I needed some sounds of like running around on like some type of wood surface, like some kind of wood plank surface or something like that. So I find these like couple tables that are just at some. I don't want to say it's a park, but it's like some kind of like sitting area, like over by some grill or something like that. And I've got my recording device like pointed straight down at my feet, and I'm just running around like doing figure eights on these two tables that are right next to each other, and hoping that I don't fall off in the process of recording. And so, usually in situations like that, I have to kind of just think outside the box and figure out, like, okay, what do I have out there in the environment? What, what we need sounds for this, this, this. I can just go record whatever I need to record and just um, try to control that as much as I can to be able to uh, build upon that library and, and and you later on use those sounds for future projects uh, to come. So, yeah. Go ahead. I did want to add one more thing. I just remembered another element. Um, also, you don't always have to use creatures and monsters to create creatures and monsters. Um, in that aforementioned sound design mishmash of madness that I was talking about, um, I also included uh, a lot of friction sounds, metal friction, uh, some wood stressing, some other things like that. Um, you'd be surprised at what uh, really like a low, hollow metal sound can do to your creature voice. It gives it kind of like this bellowing, like nastiness it's it's pretty neat so yeah you don't always have to use creatures and stuff to make creatures and stuff oh uh, well I'm, like i just i just kind of want to talk about gun control for a second uh, i'm kidding <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> it's a joke it's a, joke. It's a <laughs> bad joke no i think part of like being a great sound designer and honestly like a good composer too is is so there's an artistic uh sort of conceptually like you it's about divorcing what the core is from where you place this right so to, you know like we could get into specifics but 
like the, like any art is like this and so sound design is no different for me it's it's about taking something that is kind of an obvious sound and then treating that a little bit you don't have to over treat it but it's about placing it on screen to something that you don't expect and that in therein lies the art form you know um, that's why we still talk about Ben Burt uh, because the, the guys essentially like and I might get stabbed for this, but Ben Burt is a fantastic DJ. You know, he's a good processor. He processes things really well. But what he does that's genius that I think we could all learn in any art form is that he takes something kind of mundane and normal. And then essentially like like the, the pitch down vocal thing is like a really good uh, uh, like place to start here. It's basically like taking your human voice and pitching it down and, and, and making it like literally no processing and just placing it to a monster. Like if you were to just imitate a monster and then place it on screen, like 90% of people would buy that it's a monster. So it's about finding creative ways. It's taking that bottle right there and then scraping it on this thing and then, you know, like getting some weird resonant texture from that and then editing that to be something else on screen to where you get to a point where you you know you're essentially selling an experience and that's it that's the whole art form you're selling an experience with music too you know like the most powerful music to me i mean it's kind of cliche now but to take a frank sinatra song that's really happy and fun and nice and then put a suicide scene over it you know that's powerful you know and that's kind of what we do as sound designers we kill ourselves to frank sinatra <laughs> Hey, can I take it? Can I get the TT? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, I'll be right. All right, so on that note, completely opposite from Foley, I want to give everyone a tip, uh, something that's been very useful in my career, and uh, is if you don't have access to sound effects, follow your own sounds, but if you, you don't, if you want to get sound effects and the best, and you want to just get exactly what you want, sounddogs.com is a great resource and I highly recommend it uh, for buying and uh, purchasing online a la carte your sound effects. So what you need, you can search for it and you can buy it on sounddogs.com and I've been using it for years. Um, so I want to let everybody know that we're going to be um, having a Q and A uh, portion after the panel is done. So if you have any questions, like think about them and hold them off till the end. Uh, and now we're going to move on to diversity. And I would like to know what your experience is with gender balance in the industry. Um, I've been really lucky uh, because most of my career now has been at every and our audio department is 50 percent women which is extremely unusual i actually looked this up but uh gama sutra did a big old game industry wide survey back in 2014 and uh it, according to that survey, 9% of all professional audio developers were women, which is more than I expected, uh, but it's still only 9%. It's not a lot. Um, we are out there, though, and uh, every is just a very interesting exception to the rule. Yeah, it is great working with other women. I've always kind of been the lone woman around and starting out in bands and everything, being a keyboard player and not a female singer. Um, but I've never had any, I think, adverse problems being a woman. I think it's actually been a plus in my, in my career because it kind of gets your foot in the door a little bit more because people are just almost more willing to listen to you. Sorry, guys. But it, it, it's always at least helped for me, and I've never really had anybody say anything poorly about it. Have you, Emily? Um, I mean, I've, I've seen, like, some basic, like, I've never seen anything, like, horrible directed at me. Um, I mean, that, that makes it sound really bad. That makes it sound like I've had, like, 
still pretty bad things directed at me, but I haven't even had that. Um, I've had a couple of like awkward experiences, like when I was at GDC and I got like hit on by a hella married dude. Like, <laughs> not like at one of the after parties, but like at the professional conference itself. Ooh. Don't yeah, do that. Healthy. Don't do that to some. He was super married. <laughs> that's it's it's kind of the same in any industry though. Yeah, I've yeah, that's the corporate the thing. industry before, <laughs> and there's there's people that say nasty things everywhere. But I I can't say I've seen anything bad being female. In fact, it's been a plus for me. I wish there was more women out there in the game industry. Yeah, I don't know if it's necessarily been a plus for me, but it hasn't been like a super major negative. Like occasionally, like a guy will say something that's like kind of weird and sketchy and it'll be like well I don't really know why you said that but I don't really feel the need to draw attention to it either um, like one example I was at a game audio event also at GDC and we were just all talking about past projects and uh, one of the the dude I was actually sitting next to was like oh yeah well you know I was just working on a movie it was it was really weird it was a really weird movie one of those women directors, you know? And it's just like, okay, well, now I don't want to talk to you anymore. It's <laughs> a, a weird way to describe a movie. I know, I know. It's w so weird that that's the first thing he went to. So, like, I do think that there's a little bit of weirdness out there, um, but I, I don't think it's, like, so debilitating that it should keep people away. Hopefully. So, I mean, that's just my experience. <laughs> um, um, I will actually say something on this. What? 50% uh, of the Rooster Teeth audio team, which is me and one other person, is female. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that, was my, that was my first hire as the lead sound designer there. Uh, they told me to, you know, scour through resumes and so on. And gender, race, none of that really came into it. It's, it's all about... How well do you do your job? Because if you do it poorly, I'm not going to look at your resume. Or your demo reel or anything like that. Or maybe I will if you ask nicely and then I'll, I'll give you whatever feedback I can possibly offer. Um, but yeah, it's interesting because being... So at King's Isle, there was actually um, quite a few women that worked there of all disciplines. From production to programming to... Um, we have so many on the sound team. Um, so it wasn't... It wasn't like, um, it wasn't like there were a million, like it wasn't 50-50, like 50% women, 50% men, but there was actually a surprising amount there for what I've understood being, you know, working in the games industry. Uh, funny enough, being once removed and being now in the animation industry, it's like 35% of the company is, is female, which is awesome. It's great to kind of get, uh, some diversity. There's also, uh, it's interesting uh, more diversity, not only just gender diversity, but uh, racial diversity all throughout uh, the company that I work for. I'm not trying to plug Rooster Teeth, I'm just saying it's really interesting, it's a, it's a neat uh, observation. Because, um, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't know if that's something that's often talked about, is, is diversity as a whole in the games industry. But yeah, it's, it's really neat to be working in a place where I'm like on a, a panel with, you know, as many women as there are men on the stage. Um, and, and I hope to see more diversity as, you know, we get smarter and people are more accepting and not complete racist, bigot, stupid people as we go. So, yeah, just wanted to add that. Anyone else? Okay. So, um, what, what stereotypes do you think exist in the, game, in the industry? In, uh, regarding diversity as a whole. Uh, could you elaborate on that question? Okay, so for example, characters. Um, I had a friend and she was saying that she only, whenever she would, um, people would be asking her for, you know, to do a character, they would be consistently asking for Russian, uh -huh. sexy Russian females. And she's like, I'm really tired of getting asked that. And I'd like, you know, the variety of things. It's, it's really interesting that, like, a character would be described as a sexy Russian female because you could be like, like a 35 year old man with a really nice voice. Thank you. Yeah. And be, <laughs> and be a sexy Russian female, I suppose. Um, I mean, I, I have seen that stereotype, but not because it's like, 
it's weird. It's not because it's like, oh yeah, she's a woman and she can only do this type of thing. It's like, yeah, this particular voice actor can only perform in this range and this is what they're good at. Um, I, I, it's kind of a weird, like, I remember, I remember like, I don't know, thinking about this question is kind of interesting because, yeah, I guess there are, there are some stereotypes, but I never peg it as sexy Russian female. It's always like, oh, this particular female voice actor can do really great creature vocals. So that's, you know, what we call her for. Oh, hey, maybe there's something else. We'll try. If it works, it works. Um, but yeah, I'm not trying to, like, cop out of that. Maybe someone else has a better answer. I Go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to add, I just, just to clarify, are we talking, like, uh, stereotypes amongst uh, game developers or stereotypes amongst uh female game characters, because those are two very different animals. Well, I think, if I remember like the, the question correctly, is more like, if we were to cast Kelly for something, is Kelly only going to be cast for this array? Is that kind of what you're asking? Or are you more so talking about, yeah. like, if I hire a female sound designer, I'm going to be worried because she might be a total, you know, blee blah to me all the time. <laughs> is that what you're talking about? Well, I would like to discuss both, but okay. the question was more based on, um, like, if you get cast as only, like, specifically sexy characters, though you can do stuff beyond that range, um, it's just that that's all people, that's all that's really being asked for. I, I can say, for, so I used to do a lot of, um, like, anime. I, I did a lot of anime series, and those were, phew, some of those were tough. I mean, the, a lot of the characters were, were um, sexy, they were young, um, they weren't very bright, you know, it was just really bad stereotypes, and I mean, honestly, I, some of them, I'm like, I didn't do that, you know, I mean, but a lot of the characters were really, um, like, sexualized in the anime world. Mm -hmm. I haven't, for, for me, I haven't experienced that as much in the gaming industry. Um, I feel like I've gotten to play a lot of really strong female characters that are, and, and some of them may have more of a sexy kind of thing to them, but they come off really strong and really bold, and, and they're, not all, um, they're not all sexy. Some of them are like commanders, and in, in some ways, games have, I've found that they do have opportunities for women to play um, really cool characters that, that, that you wouldn't expect, kind of unexpected characters. That's been my experience. I feel that um, as a whole, as far as stereotypes are concerned, I think there's a lot of people making games that, um, are, you know, it's sort of like games by numbers, you know, like it's, it's funny because I've done, you know, I was sitting in the bathtub this morning, listening to NPR and doing my Kegel exercises, and I was thinking to myself, I was like, Wait, what? <laughs> I was like, there's like, um, there's this consistency and like part of, I think it, you know, like I'm about 14 or 15 years in as well. And, you know, there's a part of me that gets a little over it at times. And what I get over is there's a, it's not just stereotype characters, there's stereotype storylines and there, this is an art form is still fledgling. You know, I, I not, not only do I want to see like, uh, equality and diversity in characters in video games, but I also want to see us do things other than kill shit. And um, you know, I think as an art form, I think it's so binary at the moment. We, it, it's not. I mean, there's indie games, but at the at its core, there, you know, it's a pass or fail situation. Like there's an exploration of play that I think that we should truly explore. That's we're just now um, sort of like getting to the point that we can actually explore that because we're, we, we're 30 or 40 years old now and uh, I've you know I'm excited to work on things that go beyond uh, there's it's funny you know like in my career there's there's times where I've been really sort of depressed honestly and part of the reason that I'm depressed is I get an email from two different clients are like hey um, so like when you capture this team's flag we need it to go bum 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 and then the other guy, like from the other company, sends me an email that says, "Hey, when you capture this team's flag, we need to go bam, bam, bam." And I'm like, "Okay, okay." And then I just like I shed a few tears, uh, you know. And then that "Hello, darkness, my old friend" <laughs> sort of comes on. So, so I think as far as stereotypes, uh, you know, like there's there's an art form that we're working in right now, and I think we're getting out of it. That 
when your when your high art is aliens, we're fucked, you know. And like we're finally leaving that point, and and I and I'm excited about that, and it's starting to happen. Yeah. On on that note, there's a lot of really great games that do feature um, female characters that kind of break the mold a little bit. That aren't about all like muscly men shooty guns time you know um i actually just finished playing uh life is strange last month that's a really good example um and of course i mean there's always gone home you know gone home so great i'm still not over it and so i gotta i gotta believe that as the industry itself diversifies and as more people with different life experiences get into the higher ranks that we'll see more games like this that um aren't afraid to be different and aren't afraid to be not necessarily like non-violent but aren't afraid to like put violence at the forefront all right hey what? we're good Okay. You good? I'm good. Um, do y'all have any last thoughts? Are we going to die? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Game There's over. no Santa Claus. <laughs> what? <laughs> Game over. I want to suggest some of those resources that I just posted up there. There's a lot of them, and I'm going to be posting them up on the uh, AustinGameDevs.org website, Austin IGDA, and take out your phones and please click now because I'm going to go to the next resource. We'll also be sharing these um, on the Wiggy Facebook group and Facebook page. Uh, so if you want, you can find them there too. Highly encourage y'all as composers, as sound designers to get active and ask questions to these people who have been so generous to come here tonight and really give a piece of their soul to us. Thank you all to the panelists. That. And two of those books, uh, I'd like to say that Matt is in two of those. So uh, we've got some good people on our panels tonight. Thank you. And boom, boom. Thank you all for coming tonight. Are you really a mime? Are you really a mime? Okay, we're going to oh, do yes. questions. Hashtag all the um, bonus. Raise your hand and I'll come to you. But you must tweet hashtag all the bonus first. <laughs> all right, there you go. <laughs> Randall, you win. <laughs> so what software do you guys use for sound editing, fulling, uh, mixing, uh, both with ideal budget or on a budget? Right now, I mean, Logic's really the only digital workstation that I'm currently using right now. I also have learned Reaper a little bit for teaching purposes to uh, teach uh, kids how to write music and create sound effects uh, through a, a digital audio workstation that's a little bit more accessible to them. So uh, Logic's my main uh, digital audio workstation of choice. Reaper is free to download. I recommend checking it out. It's super great, and it's pretty powerful, and it's fully customizable. Uh, if you want to pay the man, and give him a lot of money, he can go buy Pro Tools. That also does the job. I use Adobe Audition for my sound design because it's also a multi-track, but it's a phenomenal editor. It has spectral view. It's a great editor. You can do sound design really fast in it. I use Sonar, Cakewalk Sonar as my DAW, but I love doing my sound design in Adobe Audition. Um, at my home studio, I use a combination of Reaper and Pro Tools, but then at my work studio at Every, I use a combination of Ableton and Reason, and I've also used Cubase. Um, what I've learned from using so many DAWs is that most of them are, they're, they all mostly do the same things. Some are better at certain things than others. Uh, Ableton is particularly good. If I could afford it, I'd have it at home too. <laughs> But uh, Reaper's free and Reaper's great. Um, I was actually just looking at a list of AAA games that use Reaper. I got a lot of uh, heavy hitters on there. 
a lot of Assassin's Creed games, for instance. I think Journey too. So you know, don't don't be afraid to use something, even though like it's cheap. Reaper's really powerful. Pro Tools is now free too, folks. What? Yeah, it's been free. There's a free version out Wait, there. Wait, what? No. There's a free version. Then why did out I spend six hundred dollars on it? Yes, there is. <laughs> no, uh, yes, it, there it is. might exist, but nah. I, I use Audition in Ableton. But yeah. don't go for it if you don't want it. <laughs> version 10. Version 10 of is free Really? Like, wow. Free to download and free to put on like for, whatever for every new you're track, on. do you have to like pay a dollar or something? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a bad idea. That's actually not. That's a good yeah. idea. Yeah. Shipped Apple and, and Studio One is free too. Dollar. And I love that one too. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yo. Oh, you want to open a, a D verb? Yeah. Yeah, buddy. Six bucks. <laughs> Yeah, right here. Talk to me. What's on your heart? What's up, man? Hey, Hi, Randall. <laughs> Hashtag all boners. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so we have to be, as sound designers and voice actors and and musicians, you have to advocate for your craft, but this tends to be a culture of audio last. How do you advocate for your craft when you're working with either indie developers or even AAA developers to say this has to get done and how do you do that do you get it you try to get information earlier in the process how early do you get in the process to be effective in the end right okay this is this is a loaded question i think and not, not loaded in the sense that like there's a there's a there's a big answer like I, and i don't like the answer that i'm going to give it's just sort of where i've landed in life um Sound is something that mo a lot of people, when they test games, because it's just more convenient, they test it with the sound off. Just plain and simple, you know? Like, whether we like it or not, even though it's our art form, a lot of your audience turns off the sound on their television and, like, listens to Linkin Park or Katy Perry or whoever. Um, you know, your people that are really experiencing it... Um, you know they uh, they will listen to it. They'll like get into the sound, and it's it's an integral part of the experience. I completely believe this. However, you know selling developers on that is a very difficult thing. So you really just deal with it. In my experience, like you 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 basically like you advocate for getting in as early as possible, even concept art phase, because I feel like that you can concept sound just as effectively as visuals. However. Um, the, the the world isn't hasn't in, you know without with, that, with a few exceptions doesn't really work like that so basically I deal with as a creative individual I deal with like the sort of cards that have been dealt and I try to make the best of it you know like by bringing more people on and try by trying to have a baby in one month essentially you know by getting nine people you know what I'm saying like uh, it's just an it, it's something that I think will event no, I don't know if it'll ever change. It's just been what it is. You just basically find a way to maximize your time to deal with it. I think a lot of that also kind of comes from being able to uh, talk about how uh, how important it is to define that core sound that makes the game that, that you're working on what it is. When people are playing any of the games that they've played up to this up until this point, all the way from way back in the regular regular Nintendo or or the or the Sega Genesis or whatever system you started with, most people are probably they they might remember some of the gameplay stuff, they might remember some of the graphics stuff and whatnot, which is fine and all and all and all that. But people remember people will remember the sounds a lot more than they will any other aspect. And so, because of that, I personally I personally would say just you know just do everything you can to just convince them from day one that like you know the audio people need to be involved in the design process from the get-go and then that way you can kind of develop that that core sound and be able to have as much time as humanly possible to essentially define that game there are a lot of defining elements within the game you know the gameplay the graphics the whole nine yards but Having that sound element that makes that game distinctively what it is, um, that's going to be a huge selling point, and that's going to if you can convince them up, if you convince people up, uh, the higher ups, the producers of that, um, that will uh, that will allow them to, to to understand where you're going with with this vision, and hopefully get 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 you on board with being able to uh, 
being able to to work on that from the get-go. Um, I had published an article earlier this week on Medium about how to get the most out of audio specialists, and I kind of directed it towards um, towards uh, anybody who's not an audio an audio specialist to kind of push that point to be able to um, get involved from the get-go, so that you can have plenty of time to work on that. Um, to work on that defining sound that becomes iconic for that particular game. So. I just want to clarify. Please search for Avid Pro Tools first, and it's free to download. And also Studio One Three, which uh, is by Presonus. Presonus, it's a free software. Both of them are free, and uh, they're wonderful tools. All right, so first of all, I wanted to say it's just been a pleasure having the opportunity to hear all of you speak tonight. I love all the Reaper love up on the stage. Now, I have two different careers right now. I work as both a voice actor and an audio engineer, just relocated from the East Coast, and use both careers to support each other. With voice acting work, I found that getting into specialized demos happened to facilitate being able to convey my work and being able to make connections really show my fortes. Do you find with audio engineering that it is a benefit to have a strong demo, or do you feel you, if you were to hire a candidate right now, you could find someone based on their resume and their work snippets, and if you would seek a demo, is there a certain way in which you would structure it, what you would like to be seeing from somewhere coming on for a particular role? Ooh, I'm sorry. I Jump in on this one. Yeah. Take it. Demo. Yes. Like one minute to two minutes tops. Resume, more important. Okay. Personality and way you come across, most important. I don't really care um, like about a resume. Um, I care about it only in the sense of what you've shipped and what you've worked on. I don't care about where you went to school. I don't care about like you being some sort of, um, I don't know, like in some cricket club or something. Um, I care about it only in the sense of like what you worked on, what you did and like how long you did it for and if they hired you again that's a really good sign demo minute to two minutes i don't want this long like super long thing i want to know exactly what you did on the demo and where i can find it and how quickly i can get to that point and then that's a much easier choice to make make it painless for the person hiring you yeah if you if you have a website um make the first thing i see on your website your demo reel because if I have to go hunting for it, I'm, I'm, I work on like five shows simultaneously. And I ain't got time for that. I can so. tell you many times when we've been hiring at Every, even when we were hi hiring uh, Emily, <laughs> there was so many people that sent resumes where we couldn't find where their demo was. They'd have a link that would go to somewhere, to somewhere else. Make it easy for us. We don't have the time. Just put it right here. Go to SoundCloud. Go to something. Don't send me to some bizarre <laughs> website that I have to search through 20 pages to find yeah, it. Yeah, on that note, um, when I did get hired at Every, when I put in my application, I made damn sure that that demo reel was right on my homepage, emilyemail.com, like super, just, just my name, dot com. There's my demo reel. Real simple. <laughs> um, and, and if you don't, so if you haven't had the experience of working in the industry or you haven't met anybody who wants to, you know, give you work, um, go to YouTube and download trailers and just redesign that stuff. Um, yeah. And I'm talking like fully redesign it. Like you're, you're doing a Halo trailer. Don't use the bubble shield sound or any of that other garbage because I'm just going to think you're, you know, you're like kind of trying to. Uh, creative. Yeah. Yeah. So be creative, um, and yeah, grab grab videos off the internet. But yeah, for me personally, make a demo reel. Yeah. Make it good. I actually so my demo reel doesn't exist anymore. It's just a link to my J Day website. Um, uh, so actually, there's a guy, Yaman. Yeah. There's a guy in the back there, Chris, and I hired him about what six years ago, something like that. Um, and his demo was he recreated the Hell Hellboy trailer, and it was fucking stellar. And I was just like, like literally, like I was like, one minute long. I didn't have to think about it. I was like, this is really good. I watched it again. I was like, yeah, move from Philadelphia or wherever you're at. So it's as simple as that. I'll chime in on this one as well. The 
when you get your when you get your demo reels, you know, put together and everything and all that and all that jazz, definitely get other people to look at it before you submit it to uh, any of the higher ups who are who have the power in their hands to to hire you or to laugh in your face or whatever. Uh, definitely just make sure that make sure that they can they can for sure look at your reel and figure out, hey, this is good because whatever. This needs a lot of work because whatever. I had for example, submit. I uh, found out through my you know social media feeds on Twitter that um, that there's like this audio house up in Vancouver that was uh, reviewing uh, reviewing demo reels and stuff like that. So I submitted my stuff for it, and yeah, they 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 they, they, they tore it apart, and and I'm definitely glad that they you know were able to <laughs> were able to uh, you know give me the, the constructive criticism necessary to kind of clean up a lot of the garbage that was on there and make it a little bit more. Uh, streamlined and very much more accessible. So, wait, wait, I just want to add one more thing, real quick. Yeah, yeah. Put your best work at the front. If you're going to do multiple videos, make sure your like your good stuff is at the front. You can have it trickling throughout, but like, make it really big at the front to catch my attention or catch someone's attention, not just me in particular. Last tip, and then I've got to go smoke a cigarette. Um, do like very specific things, like. If you want to be a sound designer for like implement like level sound design, you do environment stuff and keep it very simple. If you want to do UI user interface stuff, but be very niche. Don't do the music, the voiceover, and the sound effects for like a Batman trailer. It's just too intense. Yeah, you want to keep it hyper focused. Hyper focused. Be very niche in the beginning. Uh, yeah, for me, I was very curious. How do you go about delivering a specific emotion, or what is your favorite like tip or method about uh, going about doing that? Uh, uh, could you could you elaborate, maybe? So um, basically, if you're trying to make the uh, listener feel, say, sad uh, or excited, like, what's your favorite way to go about doing that? Uh, just well, show them a picture of their father and very disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah. I mean, I mean, that's the easy way to do it, obviously. I would say that there's definitely a number of ways to do that. One that I personally like to use is very, very long, elongated sounds, like a lot of like a lot of orchestral strings. Um, I typically tend to use like one, maybe one singular solo violin over like some type of um, long string section, maybe using woodwinds, like pr practically almost no brass, no percussion, because those certain instrument groups are going to portray certain certain sounds certain sounds or certain emotions that you don't really want in that particular section sometimes having less is more and maybe if you're only using one two three instruments or something like that you can get a lot of mileage out of that purposely by reducing your instrumentation and only using just a few instruments maybe only using like two violins and a cello or something like that or maybe just one solo soprano with the piano or something like that. Um, it's a lot of experimenting with different with, with different written passages to figure out like, okay, does this chord progression work? Um, what did composers a long time ago use to evoke those emotions? Um, study their work. If you can get, ever get a chance to get any of their scores um, out in front of you, just just take a look at it and figure out like, okay, they use this kind of they use this kind of chord structure. Um, they were using certain characteristic sounds in these particular instruments, like the, viol the violins did this, the violas did this, and they, that achieved this particular emotion here. And um, just studying some of those composers uh, from a long time ago uh, will definitely help to figure out what they've done and how they've been successful at that, and in turn use those skills to um, apply that to your current work. I can give you a short answer for invoking surprise. Uh, the absence of sound is beautiful. Um, right before a very big hit, you want to catch someone off guard, drop out all the sound. Like, like instantaneously following that up with something big and boomy, or whatever it might be, will likely, for me, I found, you know, have more of a, an impact, be more impactful um, right then and there. That's, uh, that's one of the emotions that I tried very hard to convey with a lot of the big fighting stuff that we do for uh, some of the shows that I work on. Also, music composition. You've got certain emotions that you want to uh, emit. Um, go find music that you f find is similar to what you want to do. 
and try put that in your track and try to emulate that not exactly that's plagiarism but close to that then you can start hearing oh my god they've got this happening here there's a pad here there's this here and the more you do that the better you're going to get because you're going to as a composer you're going to hear that all the time we have to do at every we do every style of music possible and there's been many that you're just like well, how in the hell am I going to do that? So you just find the type of music that they're looking for and you start trying to emulate that. And after a while, you learn those styles and it just becomes easy for you. My question... No, sorry. My question is... I guess my question is, what sort of things do you need to do different in sound design? Like, uh, uh, blast. Don't rush, take your time. What I was trying to say is, what do you think you need to do different sound design, designing stuff with like VR instead of things you play on monitors? Yeah. Have you done? Have you done really you You're asking, like, should you approach sound? Look at me in the eye. You're asking me if you should approach sound design differently when you do VR versus when you work on something on screen? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. Well, everything is much more difficult basically because things need to be spatialized because your head can move at any time. So there's a trick that we always use in, in, in the current uh, on screen where you put a lot of things in 2D because you it's... Since it's you, essentially the camera's always here, you know that when this thing falls and this thing happens here and this door blasts open, you can bake that into one sound. That sound can be streaming and you can fire that off when a player enters this trigger. It's a very simple implementation. Now, when you are in VR and your head can be anywhere at any time, essentially you have to say, okay, so this blast, it's a, just a, a, basically it's a much more modular approach. So the door has to happen from the door and your your blast has to happen from the like top left corner and things like this and you have to consider like um, height like which you don't really have to consider when you're dealing with sound for television you know there's like a lot of things that just make it more difficult it's more fun in a sense but the implementation time is greatly increased because honestly VR is actual real deal game audio and a lot of times like would like take a uh you know like a call of duty or something like that like that game is essentially like a haunted house and then you run through and you hit triggers and like dudes come out and you shoot them and you're like cool like it feels really intense but if you really just chill out and sit back you'll notice those guys don't really want to kill you like that bad like they're actually like 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 deep down they're like you know, he's a good guy like he might be like a white dude and i know he's like in our country trying to kill us but he's like not a bad dude i mean we could kick it sometime and like listen to some music and smoke out you know like like i think there's like that thing with call of duty and like with these games where you can fake so many things because like you're you're basing it on player intensity. Now in the VR world, you actually have to use real game audio skills. You have to place these things where they're coming from. And I can't believe that I brought that shit right back around because I went there. Like I went to a place. I was, I was waiting for you to go for Steve. I know, I know, no, no, no. Like I can't bring Steve, Steve back. back. Uh, anyway, yeah. So like um, sound design for game audio from a production standpoint is more difficult. From the user standpoint, uh, I think the technologies still needs to catch up because we need to be able to play all these modular elements in an efficient way. Okay. Um, you guys, uh, that, oh, sorry. You already asked my question, so I have a slightly different one. Uh, you, you, you were saying something about um, uh, you guys filming this and putting this online? Where? Oh. Uh, like, Where is the feed for this going to be going? Oh, say it again. Uh, she wanted uh, she wanted to know where the feed for the uh, um fil the recording of this is going to be, and we're going to put it up on the uh, Wiggy site and also the IGDA Austin site. Yep, or Austin, Austin Game Dev. Yeah. 
austingamedevs.org. Okay, any other questions? Okay. We can have like, a couple more and then we're going to have to let everybody go and socialize and stuff. Chief. Chief. All right, uh, thank you very much for this uh, presentation and for being here. Uh, I really like the points where you touch on uh, concept sound can be a thing as well as developing the core sound is important. I know in game development at the beginning when they do documentation, maybe a sound document might be this game will be dreary or this, this game will be happy. Now, when they bring on the audio team, do, do they give you all the option to create your own sound document and do you even create a sound document because from what it sounds like uh some of you all kind of just kind of jump in and create the sound no, as you go that's a great question that was one of our questions go ahead emily i'll probably start by saying that uh if you're the if you're the only person on the, on the audio team Typically, you definitely want to make sure that everybody else on your team is kind of on board with the sound direction that you're going with. Um, if they don't have an idea, definitely create one. Um, definitely get some ideas, get some ideas, get them written down on paper. Don't just have them up in your head. Having, creating your own, basically your own sound design document definitely helps to um, get your ideas down on paper and how other people see that uh, may not be the same way that you see it. And um, if there's if if there's any kind of differences or disagreements or whatever, then that's what the design document is for to to remove ideas that don't work, to keep the ones that do work, and then from there figure out okay, how do we develop this idea even further? What what kind of instrumentation am I going to use for these tracks? What kind of uh, what kind of sound effects am I going to use? What am I going to have to go record? Uh, what am I going to have to Im implement? That kind of thing. And so um, it's just a matter of making sure that everyone on your team is on board with with the with the with the audio direction that you're going with. And if they if if nobody else on your team has an idea, start 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 just chiming in and just start creating your own ideas and just see what sticks. And definitely, as soon as you get done with whatever you're creating, personal opinion, get them to listen to it and make sure that hey, we wrote about this in the document. Here's what I got so far. They listen to it. Does it sound good? Does it sound too blank? Fill in the blank with whatever adjective. Um, getting their input on a regular basis uh, definitely helps to refine it. Do, how many how many retakes is it going to take to make sure that this particular track is the way the way it's supposed to be? Um, same thing with sound effects too. Just you know, have them play through the scene and figure out like, does does this shotgun actually sound like a, sh a shotgun? Do these footsteps sound like footsteps? Uh, does this door opening sound like an actual door opening? Um, if it's if if it works, awesome. If it doesn't, definitely get their honest feedback, and uh, that way that way we they, we can continue to refine the process and make sure that what what you're creating is for sure what the team is looking for. Yeah, I was trying to buy a live panther off of eBay, so like I might have not heard your entire. Uh, question, but I think I get the gist of it, and that for me, like we differ in this, and that's we everyone has their own process. I tend to like, um, excuse me, I'm just kidding. Live Panther time. Uh, that'd be fucking rad on a Live Panther for like two days. Just you know, like invite your family over and be like, hey, come sit down with this Panther. Anyway, um, so I put things in game really quickly. And the reason that I do that is because uh, people get used to hearing certain things, just like they get used to seeing certain things, just like they get used to routines of any type. The quicker that you can get your sounds in game and be very experimental and do exactly what it is artistically you want to do initially, like music is a huge thing. If you can put something in that you would actually want to create, uh, or that you think is like like genre pushing or or, or, or ballsy. If you could do that early on, um, that's what the studio as a group that are developing this product are going to get used to, and that's what they're going to say. Yeah, this this works, you know. And so for me, I basically fire a lot of quick ideas early, and I'm really risky with those ideas early on. And then later, I write it down, and I'm like, oh yeah, because I have to do all these things. And I'll be honest, it's not the most most efficient process but creatively I think it works uh, at least for me maybe not for everyone but yeah that's my experience hello everyone my name is Clint Smith I'm an aspiring uh, game uh, sound designer 
Uh, I have a question here. Um, I guess a good segue from what Matt was saying about uh, trying to get your games, your sounds into game as fast as possible. Uh, I didn't hear any mention of uh, F mod at all, or maybe uh, scripting as in, as you know JavaScript or anything uh, of that sort being implemented or uh, needing to know. Right. Personally, I'll I'll start and say that learning middleware. This thing's about to fall over. Learning middleware is definitely, I would say, very very important because, especially early on, if you are able to learn the middleware and learn how those integrate with the, how those take the sound assets that you've created and are able to implement those in in Unity or Unreal or whatever engine you're using. Uh, if you're able to to to, to learn that middleware and and are able to show that what you can do with that and you're able to demo that somewhere, that proves that you're not just a one-trick pony. That proves that you can write music and create sound effects and get them into the game because a lot of uh, because there's a lot of in-house studios that will in their job descriptions will always ask you know can you can you you know can you create the sounds can you also implement them like I honestly can't think of very many um, job listings out there for for sound designers that don't involve both and so um, there are a lot of tutorial videos out there like just hit up YouTube and just spend a day on YouTube and just learn the middleware and definitely download the engines and learn how not only not only learn how to create whatever events that you need to create within your middleware but also understand how those how those programs interact with Unreal or with Unity or with whatever engine that you're working with so that way you can show to people, you know, what your technical skills are. Middleware, quick. Yeah, Wise is great. FMOD is great. Um, I've heard good things about Fabric. Uh, for me, personally, uh, I very much prefer to do all my implementation myself because I've done game jams before where, you know, it's a game jam, so you have to give up those assets super quick, so I just pass them off to the programmer and then... I hear the sounds in the game and I'm like, what the hell were you thinking? Why is that so loud? Why is that so quiet? Why didn't I just do this myself? Because it's a game jam. So, um, if, that's, if that's something that you haven't experimented with, I can't recommend it enough. Uh, the more control that you have as a sound designer over how the sounds are played in the game, the better. Definitely. Don't leave it up to the programmer. And middleware allows you that? Is that is that what you're saying? So there's there's middleware. There's like a middleware concept, like FMOD WISE, but then there's like, you have to have the engine it's connected to. So there's a free demo on the WISE website for Limbo and then one for Cube. Yeah. And basically, like, I won't look at anybody or even take them seriously unless they know that. That's part of the, that's the gig. Like, you're doing game audio, like, you have to understand abstraction layers. You have to understand, like, um, the player experience and, and providing feedback to the player. And, like, uh, honestly, it's, like, it's too easy these days to have access to that. That, you know, when I started, no, it was much more difficult. Like, it, it was way harder to actually do this. But nowadays, it's so simple to actually create an interactive demo that there's if you're doing game audio and you don't have an interactive demo and experience with that you might as well i don't know like do something else like that that's it's just that's what we need i want to all right we have one more one more question and then we're going to let our we panelists encourage one more um off the stage y'all can stay and socialize if you like uh hello it's like uh, I actually have a creative question. Okay. okay, I have a creative question for the composers. Um, all right, how about now? Just like yelling. Don't yell. Don't do that. Okay, so I have a creative question for the composers. It's how do you make something original because I heard you saying that you have to, I guess, reference other music as well, like whether it be orchestral, or electronic, whatever it is for what you're making. How do you make something original without copying too much from other sources? I have a lot of tricks for this, actually, because <laughs> I have done this a lot. Um, basically, well, you could take different uh, instrumental and rhythmic ideas, but uh, for one thing, 
don't steal melodies. That's super, super basic. And yet I still sometimes see it done. Don't steal melodies. Don't steal motives. Uh, don't steal speeches. Don't steal speeches. Hello. <laughs> Keeping it topical. Change. Change the key. Always, always change the key. It's a really, really easy way to differentiate some the piece that you're working on from the piece that you're trying to emulate. And definitely don't don't be afraid to push the boundaries and to try something and to try something just completely off the wall new to make it your own. So that's just some real specific things you could do. All right, I want to encourage everybody to ask these people questions in the next few minutes, but we're going to wrap up right now. We want to thank all of you for coming here tonight because it's been a great turnout and a lot of interest. And the panelists were fantastic. Let's give them a round of applause. Of applause. And please, the service has been fantastic, hasn't it? Let's give the waitresses and waiters all the best money. that we can give, give them money. out of our pockets. And thanks to Mr. Tramps. And thanks to IGDA Austin hey, Matt. and Wiggy. Hey Matt. hey, Matt, come back. Also, uh, we, have to take, we have to take a photo. Also, oh. yes. uh, thanks you guys for coming out on a school night and hanging out with us. Yes, and we got a photo to take of all these people on the panelists real quick, and then you can cut out, because I know a lot of these people are going to rock the world in Austin tonight. Beer. Hooray, beer. Yes, lights up, Randall.